In the story of David and Goliath, a young boy defeats a military giant, a hero, with a stone and a sling. All of God's people before that moment were in shame before this powerful enemy, this giant, because he was treating them with contempt, especially their God. But when the young boy David arrives, all who were present saw that there was a God in Israel. For David came against him, he said, in the name of the Lord. And for the victory belongs to men, not to men, but to God alone. This text foreshadows our text here today. And we start a new sermon series. Um, this one is on the temple, um, entitled Arrival. We just finished a seven-part sermon series on discipleship, and we saw that Jesus repeatedly showed us that the greatest in the kingdom of heaven are the humble and the dependent on God, also that the first are often the last in the kingdom of heaven, and he shows that he is willing to lead by example as well. He doesn't ask us to do anything that he wouldn't do himself. Today in our passage, Jesus arrives in Jerusalem. Palm Sunday is where we are in our text here. And he arrives in Jerusalem for his battle over sin. He will be checking also on how those who have been left in authority over the house of God are doing over the temple. So today we're going to look at three sections. The first two will identify the opponents in this great battle. And then the third one is going to be Jesus starting to reveal instruction for how his people are to engage in their part of the battle. So the first section today is entering Jerusalem. It says, Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, when Jesus sent two disciples, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. So, they are now very close to Jerusalem, and the name Jerusalem means foundation of peace. This is where God will establish his rest, his peace for humanity, which was lost in Genesis 3. <clears throat> but Bethphage, that is a whole other story. Um, so you see that this is Jerusalem here. Okay, this is the temple. Um, here's Bethphage, and this is the Mount of Olives. So the Mount of Olives is on, or I should say Bethphage is on the Mount of Olives. And Mount of Olives is the middle of three different mountains. Um, in the north, you have a mountain that's called um, uh, Mount Scopus, which actually means watchtower, which is interesting for a military uh, um, symbol. Uh, on the south of it down here is, uh, the mountain is called Mount of Corruption, isn't that interesting? Um, and this is where Jesus will not only enter into Jerusalem, but he also will leave back up to heaven from Mount of Olives. Kindron Valley, uh, Kindron means dark, very dark. Um, so the valley of darkness is what he has to cross over to get into the uh, city of Jerusalem. It's interesting because this actually is a mountain that's 300 feet above the uh, Temple Mount, so it looks down actually onto the temple. Um, the Mount of Olives. Olives is olive oil is the, is the fruit that comes from that, I guess you could say. Uh, it's an image of blessings, of prosperity, of food and healing and fuel. So for lamp, for light. Um, it's very characteristic product of the promised land. And promised land is the relationship between God and his people. So... Um, very interesting. Uh, Bethany is over here, which we will come to Bethany in just a little bit as well. But also, Bethphage means house of unripe figs. That will be important later. So remember that. <clears throat> 
So continuing. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So the whole passage here has twos. You see twos being shown. And twos are very important. Um, it can be something as far as like an opposition, which I do believe is, is signifying here. Jesus is going to battle. He is going into war. Um, he is going into Jerusalem where this war is going to take place. And you see twos all over the place. You see it can be so good and evil. It can be uh, the... Um, uh, light and darkness. Um, you saw then uh, last or two weeks ago in our last sermon for this sermon series, the two blind men and the two sons of Zebedee also, which kind of links the two passages, which means that that whole lesson is going to carry into this one a little bit. Um, absolutely. But Jesus sends two disciples into the village. All these things are not just by chance. They happen on purpose. They're literary forms to show us that these things are, these teachings are supposed to go together. They're supposed to run together. So I sometimes it doesn't always make sense. Um, you're like, well, why would he have to have two? Just like you're going to see, there's two donkeys that are here. Well, why has he got to read, ride both of the donkeys? It's a literary form is what I would say uh, that that is. It's to show that these all, it's a teaching uh, way a way of showing that these are all to go together. So the donkey is um, the provision which is to fulfill, to fulfill what the prophet says in Zechariah 9.9. 9. Now Jesus also, you'll see later on in the text, will be referred to as a prophet. So you'll see the prophet is named twice also in our text here. But basically in Zechariah 9.9, 9, it's saying that the Lord is coming to save his people from the enemy. That's what that text is referring to, and it's quoting this. So, but what's interesting is that this king is very different from what is expected from a king normally. This king has to borrow an animal to ride in to the city. He can't even afford his own animal. He has to borrow one. He comes to conquer the enemy, but at the cost of his own life. He's humble. It's another first is last example here. I think it's also interesting that Jesus' mother rides a donkey into the city of his birthplace, which is not far from Jerusalem, and Jesus rides the donkey into the death place, uh, the city of where he will die. Donkeys are a ve vehicle for the rich and the poor, so it encompasses everyone. Uh, kings and heroes both often ride on them, and they definitely are an image of one seeking peace, not war. If he wanted to ride in for war, he would be on a horse. A donkey is a symbol of he was seeking peace. He wasn't coming for war, but he knows that that will be the ultimate uh, thing that needs to be done. It's an image of humility. So continuing, the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put, them, uh, put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. So you see, I highlighted a couple of different places where you see twos also that are going through this whole thing. They're everywhere. So... Um, these two, they followed Jesus' orders. It happened just as it had said. So it, this is affirming that Jesus absolutely is prophetic. He definitely knows the future. So um, when they call him a prophet later, it's not inaccurate. He is a prophet. There's no doubt about that, but he's much more than a prophet as well. So putting the cloaks under Jesus is likely an allusion to them knowing and recognizing that he is uh, somewhat of a king, uh, even uh, the Messiah figure, actually. We'll see they'll be calling him the son of David as well, which absolutely uh, is a king figure. Um, you see in 2 Kings 9.13, they did that with Jehu. When he was announced as king then, they put uh, their cloaks down underneath him uh, so that he could walk up it. It's a statement of royalty which is recognized by all that are surrounding him. So continuing, and the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. 
So the crowds before went before him and behind him. Everyone was shouting and quoting from Psalm 118. And it's specifically verses 25 through 26. Now the pre-context to this psalm is very important. It gives me chills when you read the whole thing and you see what's going on here. And this happens a lot. When something is quoted in the New Testament, it's not just referring to that one line there. It's referring to the whole text that's around it as well. You, you get the whole package. It's not just one little line uh, that we often do uh, by quoting something. You have to consider the context. So here's what's going on here in Psalm 118. It says, The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. That is taken right out of Moses' song right after the Red Sea was split. And he, he's humbled before God, and this is part of his song, a very, very popular part, and it's quoted in many other psalms as well. But the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly and exalts. It says, I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter into them and give thanks to the Lord. Jesus is entering in through the gates of Jerusalem. He is coming there to conquer death. He is coming to deal with all these situations. He is answering the prayer of his people in, one of the, in many of the Psalms that you see read over and over and over again. So, he says, this is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. And I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. He answers the prayers of his people. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us. Hosanna is what that says. We pray, O oh Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. So what's interesting, 1 Samuel 17, 45, the giant in David and Goliath treats David and all of Israel with contempt. He even just, he scoffs at him. He's like, what is this, this child coming at me with a bunch of stones? What do you think that I am? But David says, you come at me with a sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. Hmm. Blessed are you who comes in the name of the Lord. The David-like character, the Messiah. We bless you from the house of the Lord, from the house of God. So the crowd now has accepted the insight of the two blind men from a couple weeks ago. Remember, they were cheering, and everyone's telling them to shut up, basically. Shut up, shut up. They're bless you. Uh, help us, save us, help us, uh, son of uh, David. Now they're joining in. They realize he is the son of David, so now they're quoting it also. However, the crowd says Jesus is a prophet. Again, they do see. He does know the future, but he's much more than a prophet, so they're not totally seeing him clearly here. Our text shows us, though, that this is absolutely the Messiah that was prophesied uh, from the Old Testament. Interesting that in a few days, these same people will be crying out, crucify him. When Jesus entered the city, the whole city was stirred up. The word actually means shaken in many texts. The city was shaken. Now, I do mean it, I believe that it was meant to say, you know, that it was shaken, like people were questioning of what was going on. But it's interesting because the same word is used when J Jesus dies on the cross, and it's what happens to the earth, that it shakes. When their creator dies, that the earth shakes. When their creator and their king comes into a city, the city shakes. Pretty awesome. So what happens when something arrives for us, but it looks very different than we expect it to look? We might not even see it. If we're looking over here, and it comes in over here. We see it and we're like, especially if it looks like it's limping <laughs> or has to borrow a donkey. <laughs> we might just miss it. So how flexible are we to the provisions of God, especially when it doesn't look as we expected? It's seldom 
ever does. His provisions seldom ever look like what we expect them to look. We must be careful not to make that mistake or we could find ourselves as his enemy, as we will find out here in a second. Entering the temple is this next section. It says, And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and of the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, It is written that my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. So the last section we saw that Jesus entered the city, now he enters the temple, his father's house, the place where heaven and earth meet, where God's presence dwells with humanity. He drove out. This word is used 12 times in the book of Matthew. It's the same word for casting out demons. Jesus is not happy at all. And the reason is revealed in his statement. It is written that my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. He's quoting from Isaiah 56. Again, it's important to understand the context of what's happening here. In chapters 55, it's interesting because the Lord calls out to all who are thirsty. We hear the same thing in Revelation. All who are thirsty, come and drink without cost. Seek the Lord. Come into the covenant with me. Follow me. And I will reveal my salvation to you is what he's saying. In uh, 56, which is what he's quoting from then, Before our part that he quotes from, God extends the call to all foreigners. He says, all who keep the Lord's Sabbath and walk in his way and come into covenant with me, he says, I will bring them into my house. I will bring them into my house and make them part of my divine family forever. That's pretty important, especially for us. In verse 7, he says, These I will bring, into my holy, bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. House of prayer is deeply relational. It's a relationship. It's a friendship. It's a conversation. It's a walking with. It's God providing and caring for and speaking with. It's assumed that praying is humble. So there's humility. It's a servant that comes before someone or something that's greater than them and asks for assistance. It's an expectation of faith, knowing that he will hear and that he will provide, that he will answer My house will be a place of prayer. Trusting child is often the imagery, and that's exactly what Jesus used at the very beginning of our whole last section of discipleship. Those are the greatest, those that become like a little child. So the second part of Isaiah 56, 9 through 12, which is after our text, this also is important because this is exactly what happens in our text that we're looking at today. It deals with the irresponsible leaders of Israel who abuse their positions of authority. It says, God says, they are blind watchmen without knowledge. They turn and they turn their own way and their own gain. But God says to them, who did you fear that you did not remember me and my righteous call upon your lives that you have not pursued righteousness? Who did you fear more than me that you decided not to listen to me. That gives me chills every time I think of that. And that that is a call that goes out to us as well. Who did you feel more that you decided not to listen to me? And this is exactly what Jesus is, is, um, is going to deal with. The leaders have not made the house of God a place of relationship, a place of prayer and reflection of God's likeness, his image of righteousness, but rather a place for them to gain money and cause injustice, profit for themselves in God's name. They are corrupt and have abused the gifts that God has given them, the honor that he gave them, that place of authority and privilege. Jesus' action was symbolic to how God sees and reacts to this behavior. 
His judgment and wrath will come upon them. With the gifts that God gives us absolutely does come a huge responsibility. He says that many times throughout Scripture. So, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the Son of God, or to the Son of David, they were indignant and they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? So on the other side, we see Jesus that's coming to deal with the authorities that have abused their position, but Jesus turns at the same moment and heals the oppressed and the sick, those that need help. This is the balance of, of God, and a lot of times we just want to accept his love or just accept, or sometimes we just feel like he's a God of wrath. He, he's a God that's got both, and we need to we need to embrace both of those because if we ignore either one of those, it's going to give us a very deceptive view of who God is. He absolutely is judge and very, very, it's very important to him of how his people, how they live, that they follow him, um, especially those who are in authority. But he also is a God of love completely, totally, and turns and heals them the true image of God, protector and savior. Jesus' greatest human enemies, unfortunately, are seen here as those who are in authority of his house on earth. Satan has penetrated even to the house of the Lord. It appears that there, are, there is a total defeat and takeover which has already occurred. Chief priests and the scribes are the only ones that Jesus specifically identifies in his third prophecy of his own death back in Matthew 20, 17 through 19. So it's affirming also that he is, definitely has prophetic abilities. They are indignant. They're angry. Isn't it interesting? That's the same exact word that the 10 disciples, it was used to describe the 10 disciples when the sons of Zebedee were looking for a right hand or a left hand position with Jesus, right? The other 10 were indignant, it said. They're angry, jealous. Again, another pairing of twos. They're angry that the people are calling him the son of David, that they are calling him the Messiah. They intentionally ignore his wonderful things, his wonders, his miracles. They're spiritually blind. They've chosen to ignore the works of the Holy Spirit. That is the unforgivable sin that had been talked about earlier. That they see these works that are wonders, amazing, clearly miracles, and yet they reject him. This is reminiscent of Numbers 14, the great rebellion when those spies went into the land. They were just on the edge of the promised land. And God's about ready to take them in. But those spies come back and they say, they are giants in the land. There are giants in the land. We're going to get slaughtered if we go in there. But only Caleb and Joshua were the two that had a different spirit. And God says, those 10 that did not, they saw all the works that I did in Egypt, all the things that I did, and they still reject me. They still have no faith. None of those will ever enter my rest, will ever get into the promised land. Only Joshua and Caleb who had a different spirit, who had faith, is exactly of what we're seeing here, the exact same thing. So Jesus says to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. So Jesus doesn't deny the son of David title. In fact, he goes further to proclaim his divinity by referring to Psalm 8, verses 1 and 2. This is a psalm of David. And it says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above, above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength. Because of your foes, to still the enemy and the avenger. <laughs> the purpose is to still the enemy and the avenger. So what Jesus is basically saying, he's identifying them as his enemy. <laughs> 
Not only is he claiming himself as confirming himself to be the Messiah, but he's also saying, exactly, and hasn't God already warned you that he would do that for his against his enemies when he came? <laughs> for them to go... The rest of the psalm goes on to say, What is man that you care for him? He is lower than the angels, yet you crown him with glory and honor, and you give him dominion over the works of your hands. God has come to evaluate the work of those that he left in authority. Absolutely. Jesus left the city. He didn't stay at his father's house. That's a problem. He left. Not only the house, the temple, but he left the whole city. He wouldn't even stay in the city. He spent the night in Bethany. Bethany means house of figs. That's interesting because Bethphagy means house of unripe figs. <laughs> this is the house of figs. So a ruler, to give you an image of what's going on here, a ruler which you serve and has left you in authority, came back from a long journey planning to stay with you. He came to your house. He looked around. He threw stuff around a lot, ranted and raved, and he decided not to stay there, but instead to travel away from you and stay somewhere else. What does that say about the evaluation of your boss? Is he happy? How would the Lord react to his church today, worldwide, nationwide, in our community, even in our own church? Could something be changed? I think it's healthy for us to always be thinking that, to always be wondering, to be asking God, is there something? If he's transforming each of us individually constantly into his likeness, then don't you think our church also might need transformation sometimes more and more into his likeness? Absolutely. Absolutely. What could be changed, adjusted? Is our church truly the house of God, a house of prayer? Are we a house of prayer? The instruction is the final section, ties all this together. So this is how his people are going to go forward. <clears throat> In the morning, he was returning to the city. He became hungry. And seeing a fig tree, how'd that fig tree get in there? A fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? Again, you see the fig tree mentioned twice also in there. There's a recording there's, of what happened, absolutely, but it's also a parallel as to what happened the day before in the temple, uh, what his opinion is of what happened in the temple. Um, there's two the theological points that he's, and instruction that he's giving to his disciples here. This is the first one. <clears throat> Jesus expected there to be good fruit in the temple and on that fig tree. Why? The fig tree showed leaves. The temple had the building. It had the priests. It had the sacrifices that were there. It looked like it should be bearing fruit. It had all the indications, at least, of appearing that it should be bearing fruit. But it didn't. And that's a problem. Hypocritical piety. There's very little that God hates more than that. Ab because what's happening is that we're taking his name and we're tarnishing it. That's exactly what is happening here. So a person that doesn't humble themselves to, to, and nourish themselves with God's presence, with his word, with his spirit, in prayer, in church community even, will absolutely find themselves without fruit. Though they call themselves a Christian and go to church, they have no fruit. One who fears the Lord honors him. They don't treat him with contempt. They honor him. 
They know that he is worthy of the honor. Who were you more afraid of than me that you did not listen to me? The answer for his people should be nobody. Nobody. This is why we're focusing on spiritual formation in our Bible study. It is, it's what helps us to embrace these things. True Christians will always bear fruit. Always. Always will bear fruit. Somehow, some way, somewhere will always bear fruit. Community is absolutely essential. You can't get it from watching TV at home sermons. You have to be in community in order for yourself to be able to bear fruit. You have to. This is important for the disciples to know so that they don't make the same mistakes themselves later on down the line that these chief priests and scribes are making and become enemies of God. The disciples are more interested, though, about the wonder, of course, which is better than the chief priests and the scribes because the chief priests, the chief priests and the scribes aren't even acknowledging the wonders that Jesus is doing, right? At least the disciples are in amazement and they say, look at what just happened here. They realize only God could do this. And it also highlights this as clearly being very important. So this last part of our text here, it says, Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. So you see, if you have faith twice, it is listed also in there. Those with faith in God will remember that he is God and they will honor him as such. What could be seen that could be seen in obedience to his word and careful progression in leading others to him and not away. That's what these chief priests should be doing. The accountability that they have to God. This is his home. And he just came home. Also, the illuminate, this is the second theological point. The illumination of a very powerful enemy has just been revealed and prevailed over the house of God even. However, faith in God without wavering is more powerful for it can not only wither a fig tree, but it has the power to move mountains as well. Mountains were often used as a symbol of great oppression. He's not saying literally you can take that. Can you imagine what this world would look like if people are going, watch this. I'm gonna throw this mountain into the sea. It's not what he's saying. It's absolutely a symbol, a symbolic imagery that he's using here. But he's saying um, mountains were huge places of opposition. The sea was extremely vast and could clearly swallow even, even a mountain. Um, Numbers 14, Israel did not enter into the promised land because they lacked faith. The great rebellion when they stood on the outside of the promised land didn't have faith. That's why they didn't get in the first time. Jesus is, his current, is encouraging his disciples that there is no opposition that is too big for God. Amen? There's no giant or giants. There is no country. Remember, Jesus and all his disciples were going against Rome. Paul was facing Rome by himself for the most part. Caesar, that's a mountain. Rome's not around anymore. Not like it was. Jesus is, Christianity is, it endures. It's a perfect example of the mountain that can be thrown into the sea. Have faith is what Jesus is saying and pray. Know where your power comes from and use it. If you have faith, like I said before, he puts it in there twice, it's important. House of prayer is where is the, which the temple is supposed to be for all nations, and it's now moving into the hearts of the faithful of Jesus. He's planting that seed. Faith is an essential element to all prayer. Once again, we see that from Caleb and Joshua in the Great Rebellion. Faith in God's power and willingness to get involved. 
prayer was constant from Jesus to God, even the Father. Expresses relationship, need, provision, journey, together in communication. The Lord wants us to pray to him. It's where our big guns are. Imagine the faith of David when he faced that giant. It wasn't in his ability. It was in his God. This is a picture of the descendant of David. Jesus is the descendant of David and the son of man, the representative of humanity, facing the leaders and authorities of the temple. The power behind the son of David and the son of man is much greater than the power behind the temple authorities, Satan. Jesus is saying, follow me and pray and ask for my help and I will be there for you. He expects us to have good fruit. What does our fruit say about who and whose we are? And what does our prayer life say about our faith? Is there anything that could change in you and in our church? Are we in that strong relationship that Jesus is calling us into in prayer? Are we there yet? I believe we can. I believe all people can be there. I saw the movie The War Room just recently. For those of you that have seen that, it's a very good movie. And what perfect timing uh, for this, because it fits right in here. It says, the woman that's, that's kind of the narrator for the most part of it, she says that you need to have a good battle plan to win a war. And she says, maybe you're fighting the wrong enemy. Are wives fighting their husbands or husbands fighting their wives? Or are we fighting our bosses or our children or even whatever, the government or, or whatever the case is? We're fighting the wrong enemy. Our enemy is Satan. He's the one that's behind it all. And the only one way that we win that war is by a good battle plan. And the good battle plan is by using the power that has been given to us, which is much greater than Satan. But if he takes it and tells us, don't even bother with it, it won't work, it's not that important, then he takes away the greatest power that we have, and that's why he prevails. There was a part in the movie where one of the friends is talking to another friend and this man is just, he's not on a good path at all and his wife starts to pray for him. And uh, he just, God's ultimately God is breaking him and uh, his friend is, is a very solid Christian and he says, and he tells him, he says, my wife's been praying for me. He goes, ooh. <laughs> he goes, you are you, you ain't gonna win that battle. You ain't winning that battle. I encourage you to watch that movie. It's a very good movie. In Deuteronomy 20, 1 through 4, in conclusion here, this is what Moses gives to the people before they even get to that whole great rebellion thing. This is what he tells them. He says, when you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army bigger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them for the Lord your God is with you who brought you up out of Egypt. The priest shall remind you at the battle lines. When you stand at the battle line and you look out at this army that looks bigger than you, they shall remind you, let your heart not be faint, nor fear or panic or be in dread of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies, to give you the victory. He fights for us if we pray to him. If we pray to him. We must identify the enemy. We must identify where our power is. And we must learn how to use it. And that means repentance, turning to him. And that means faithful prayer, embracing a relationship with God. Life is very tough at times, and so is the enemy, Satan. But we must know where our power is and learn how to use it. So the statement here today, 
is repentance and faithful prayer is the only victorious battle plan. That is the only battle plan that wins. And even Satan is terrified of that one. Why wouldn't we use it? Amen? Let's pray.